April 13th meeting of the Affordable Housing Trust. I'm calling us to order. We're all in person tonight without a Zoom component. Um, so tonight we're here to do a couple of things. We're here to discuss the, um, the, the bids for 25 Worcester Street, which we'll be doing in an executive session. Um, when we're completed with that, we will return to session up here um, and then consider the, um, the bid. That will be the remainder thing that we're doing tonight. I put the other thing on, or Amber put the other thing on the agenda, just so everybody would have a copy of the housing production plan. I didn't, um, at the time, um, I thought this, the RFP component was going to take up the majority of our time, which it probably still will. Um, so I didn't want to bring Karen in here um, and have her wait an hour and a half. So that's why I programmed the meeting, which will be full Zoom, next week. Um, on the 20th to just cover that. So everybody has a draft. Um, Fiona's working on some edits as well, which she'll pass, parse to us over the next week or so, I guess. And then um, everybody, you know, should probably make sure that they cover the same stuff. So when we go there, we're productive with Karen so we can move that forward quickly. Um, so anyways, we, um, we need to move into um, executive session. A uh, little rusty on this, but um, so we're, we're moving in under Chapter uh, 30A, Section 21A6. Uh, the purpose of the executive session is to consider um, the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property. And I, the chair, declare that, the, uh, that it, discussing this in the open would have a detrimental impact on the negotiating position of the public body. Um, so I will need entertain a motion to enter us into executive session. Uh, any discussion on why we're moving in? All right. That considered by roll call, starting with Brittany. Aye. Matt? Aye. Eric? Aye. Bruce is an aye. Aye. Dan is an aye. So we will be pausing the recording, going into a recess for our live session, and we will be adjourning downstairs and convening our executive session in the executive session conference room B, I believe it is. Yep. So I'm going to bring us back into session. Executive session was closed out. Um, we're waiting on just Amber to come back up. She's just grabbing some binders. She'll be right here. Uh, just for a baseline. So we um, we got two bids um, in this RFP process. One of the bids was um, disqualified. The one remaining bid um, is your gentleman's or your company's bid. Each of us has a pack, and in front of us, we have our criteria, and we probably have some questions, and want to kind of go through a bunch of this stuff in open session and record it. Why we're here. Yep. Um, we'll probably, as long as it's to everybody's satisfaction, we'll probably want to conclude this tonight. So, um, this is a pretty much our only thing that we built this evening around. Um, and then at the end, we'll have a vote. And of course, you probably have all done this before. We'll move to the next steps, make the proper introductions to our council, et cetera, et cetera, and start the, um, the next phase of this process. Okay, so everybody has the, the bullets before them. Um, I'm gonna start with um, uh, developer. The highlights of uh, developer experience and capacity, um, it's pretty straightforward. If anybody has any particular questions about this, um, let me know. If not, we can move on. Anybody? All right, moving on to the affordability components. Um, Brittany, did you have anything about uh, the breakdown here? Yeah, it was 60%, 80% AMI, and then Section 8. I'm assuming you're going to put some sort of funding to that for me. The, yes. What we would apply for for funding this project-based Section 8 units mm -hmm. through DHCD or Mass Rental Vouchers, MRVP, uh, also through DHCD for the lower income units. Uh, this type of project where you are accommodating from under 30% up to 80%, 79.9% of AMI. It's a di very difficult project to do. The tax credits 
can low income housing tax credits or LIHTC can only be used on the lower below 60 and below 50 uh, components. So if we were to apply for LIHTC for this and just apply for uh, you know half to two thirds to three quarters of the units, it, we would lose all of the equity from non LIHTC units. In other words, only about three quarters of our development costs would be eligible for that equity that gets sold into it, if you follow my mm -hmm. rationale. But the development consultant we work with, who is listed in the resume, Rick Lefferts of Commonwealth Collaborative, is a very creative fellow. And when he and I brainstormed this project, I said, you know, I, I don't think this is going to be feasible because we can't serve up to 80%. And he said, aha, income averaging. And that is what we are proposing. So we are proposing to use uh, the 9% uh, LIHTC credits but to take, uh, to find a, uh, an intermediary who is interested in investing based on the income averaging approach. And basically what you have to do is, and I, I'm grossly oversimplifying, but you have to keep the average income below 50% rather than each, and, and you have to go through all the certifications and it's all real documented income and everything, but you basically go with the average income below 50%. And that's our funding approach. There are other pieces, as I'm sure you know by now, any project uh, being developed in the 2020s has to have uh, a funding stack, we call it, and it has to have three or four or five or 10 different resources. So that's our approach. Any other questions? Oh, Please. So with, with that income averaging, is that um, is it still for, for each individual unit a maximum of 80% AMI? Okay, mm -hmm. and then also total is 50% average. So okay. you're limited in the number of 60 to 80 range uh, residents you can accommodate, but the more under 30 residents you have, the more you can accommodate at the top end. That's yeah. th th and again, I'm I'm grossly oversimplifying, but that's there's 39 that are 60 AMI, and then yep. for 80 percent, and then just five rental assistance. Okay. So like 10 percent. So, so the, the great swath is between 30 and 60. The overwhelming amount of the units is going to be between that. I'm sorry. The overwhelming amount of units is going to be in that 60, swath. Between 30 60. and 60 percent. Yeah. So it's very similar to when um, GSX for Upton Street was um, trying to make a, a deal happen with Beacon. Um, remember I brought that a couple times. Beacon came in and they were looking to finance it at a very, you know, it was considered what they said was more workforce housing as opposed to luxury. So their units were going to be based on the total unit percentage because their funding sources were very similar to what their approach. So you're going to see a lot of 30 and 60 percent interwoven in it, less units overall. Um, they didn't go that way, but through the chair, can I can I give uh, 30 seconds to introduce ourselves? Yeah, oh, did I just helpful. blow right by that? Yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry. I apologize. I was rude of me. Um, <laughs> why don't I introduce us first? Oh, great. Okay. So Bree Morgan. Yeah. Matt Often. Eric Swenson. Um, Eric Swenson also represents, he, you're on CPC? I'm, there's no relation there, though. But he is on CPC. <laughs> um, Matt's our Board of Selectmen representative. I'm Bruce Spinney. I'm, I'm chair. I'm just here. And um, Dan Kusher. Also a member of our finance committee in town. And we have Amber, who's our Amber. Um, <laughs> staff she support. Show me where to put the proposal. <laughs> and um, Fiona Poplin, town planner. He's gracious enough to be with us tonight, even though this is a ZBA project. So we're very nice of you. Um, Amber will be the point of contact through most of this. She's right on the pulse of the town, so we're in great shape. Gathered that in the first 30 seconds yeah. after I met her. <laughs> yep. Um, so please so, take the floor. So my name is Andy Howarth. I am the Director of Development and Financing at WCHR, uh, Worcester Community Housing Resources. We are uh, unusual, if not entirely unique, in that we are both a community development corporation, a nonprofit, CDC, 
and we're also a CDFI, which is a Treasury approved lender. So we do loans. We have we have made loans in Grafton to lower income uh, homeowners, uh, specializing in uh, people who have uh, seniors in particular, but people who are a little overextended on either their loan to value or their income, but they need a new furnace. They have a crisis coming, or they have a major uh, home renovation that needs to be done. So we serve people like that. We lend to developers. Uh, the, what uh, what I like to call the pickup truck developers, which is a guy or a gal that has a pickup truck and a couple of workers and wants to uh, do a housing development of some smaller scale to get them into the game. So we're, we've been around since 1994. I have personally been there since uh, the, uh, 2001. Uh, the, uh, and we have a very capable executive director, Jennifer, who is uh, involved in this process and aware of it. Uh, I have two uh, project uh, managers under uh, me, a senior and a junior, and they are uh, less experienced, but boy, are they capable. They've been picking this business up like crazy. We have a system of governance that includes a nonprofit rep board of directors that is representative of uh, the community, we have lenders, lawyers, community representatives, and so forth. You can see it on our website. And one of the people on our board of directors is next to me, uh, showing the flag and showing the commitment. And, in, and I'll let him address Yeah, Indrek Butner. I'm on the board, and I'm also the chairman of the development committee. And uh, just joined Andy to keep him company while we were waiting for the executive session. To I forgot to bring a deck of cards. <laughs> okay. I was going to bring a crossword puzzle book, but uh, so anyway, we are committed to this. Uh, we have again ta are taking it through our governance process with Indrik and the Property Development Committee, uh, committee endorsing this proposal. Uh, they will provide constant oversight as we go along, and uh, we uh, we have a number of projects in development, from ranging from small to large. And we would like to, we think this fits into our, our pipeline uh, quite well, given the usual DHCD funding cycles and knowing that we're not going to break down, break ground next year. That is, that's, it never happens. So that's the background. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, well met. And then moving into um, the next um, block of criteria, infrastructure and green design. Does anybody have any board items that would like to ask a question about here? Yeah, you're just going for lead certifiable, not actually going through the process of certifying, right? We could. I know it costs extra money. It, 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 you know, we, we put what we could fit into a, uh, a project that would meet this timeline. We can go higher. Uh, I don't want to commit to that, but we have an extremely capable firm of architects. Uh, as, as I think I mentioned, it's a minority certified firm approved by the state and these folks are I, I have had more fun working with them on conceptual design and planning for this project than anything in a while and uh, we will commit to looking at higher level certifications on energy efficiency but we think this is about all we're going to fit in as it can guarantee that we'll fit mm -hmm. in as of right now is there any what's the incentive to go further on than what you're proposing. Just better. Just yay? Yeah. You get a better plaque? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you have to get more credits, so there's more sustainability aspects to it. But okay. Some of them you can't get because of location, but. Right. So in your um, response, um, I didn't think I saw anything in terms of um, just a couple of things that we asked about was um, like the EV charging stations. Is that something you guys would typically doing put in? everywhere. Yeah. We'll put it, and what we're doing is, <coughs> and I, I thought I had mentioned it in the narrative, but what we're doing is we're putting in the infrastructure for, e for multiple EV charging stations. But you need to have a commercially viable provider to put an actual charging station onto that uh, uh, portal, onto that, that wiring. So 
plan, and we're doing this on another project right now, and working with the district planning board on how many uh, stations uh, to uh, install. But the idea is you build out the stations, uh, the, the, the cabling and the, the conduit and the locations yep. for what you expect to need in 20 or 25 years, which might be, you know, 30 stations, might be 50 stations. We try to do that infrastructure long term. But uh, at this point, we would probably be looking at, and I'm negotiating with a, a, a charger company on another project, but I'd be surprised if they give us more than three portals in 2023. Maybe more next year or the year after, but we, uh, we build the infrastructure so it will support many more and then install what, uh, what a commercial provider is willing to do. Uh, it, 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 uh, housing developers so do not make money it's running EV charging stations. Of course, stations. of course. Um, so it's demand driven. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> I get that. Um, and the, the um, roof would be uh, structurally engineered to accept solar. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And we'd love to get, you know, some of the, we, we're getting grant funding for some of our existing properties to install, to retrofit solar to it. And that's a thing. Um, can you talk at all about stormwater management? I'm sorry? About stormwater storm management. I can tell you that we have Graves Engineering of Worcester on board our team as the site engineer. Uh, Graves uh, is the municipal engineer for, uh, I think, six or seven towns. They, they handle all of our... We're uh, very familiar with them. Yeah. <laughs> and Mike Andre is one of the most creative and capable guys we've ever worked with. And like I've been doing this for almost 50... Well, no, I haven't been doing it for 50 years. Uh, and Mike is super to work with. And my philosophy on stormwater management is listen to the professionals, design around what they think the uh, future needs will be as well as the current needs, and uh, what uh, what we've shown on the plan so far. We did not have enough time to, do, uh, to have Mike do that, but uh, that is definitely in our future is consulting with the town and figuring out or maybe that will be him talking to himself. I don't know. No, uh, we work with Jeff. Okay. So uh, And Jeff's a great guy, too. But Mike is our guy, and I would uh, sick him on that problem and uh, what was necessary during the early phases of our... Okay. Thanks. Good. Anybody else have anything under that um, criteria? Okay. Moving on, uh, site design. Um, so bear with us. This is where it gets a little bit subjective from our approach. So, um, you know what, I, I will leave it open and round out the comments at the end, but um, who wants to go first? Matt? I'm happy to go, yeah. Yeah. Please. I guess um, just looking at the conceptual um, drawings that you guys put together, um, it, um, so in our uh, RFP, we ask for thoughtful and efficient site design using natural <laughs> topography. Um, I'm just trying to uh, understand maybe how you guys thought about that when, when you responded with this uh, particular building configuration. Uh, sure. Uh, we have a couple, we had multiple discussion, more discussions about this than anything else. Uh, the prototypical two building solution that was shown on the town's presentation we don't think is cost feasible. Okay. Uh, you duplicate too many uh, building components, too many systems, have separate service entries for electric and water and sewer, you have uh, two elevators uh, and elevators are very expensive. This will be much more affordable to do a central core elevator and Honestly, we think that in the buildings that we've done, that uh, the central core elevator, if it, if it can be centrally located, which obviously in new construction it can be, uh, is preferred by the residents. Uh, we have uh, our assisted living facility, 
uh, we have to deal with people that have mobility impairments and people that uh, have memory uh, issues. So uh, we have done some things where there are different colors and there are, you know, and sort of one configuration of an area. Okay, this is a place you can sit and rest. Uh, we have, the, uh, in this particular facility, we have a change in floor elevation, and we carpet that in a special way so they can see it's coming up. So we think a central elevator location works best for the residents, and it is it saves money that can be spent on other things. So that's why it's one building. Why is it this shape? Uh, two reasons. One is we wanted to preserve a uh, robust uh, planting buffer at both ends of the site which we think we have uh, achieved here but the second thing is we wanted to uh, preserve a recreation area an outside recreation area it's mostly used during the summertime obviously but there are seniors at our assisted living who go out for walks in the winter we have a patio area that is enclosed and we feel that is uh, very uh, useful so we try to encompass some of that in the design of centralizing that recreation and uh, outdoor dining area at the back of the building uh, the other thing that I think is uh, a really important factor uh, in this is that DHCD in selecting projects and in doing design when when they do a senior housing project right now they will fund projects that accommodate working elders like me who uh, can park a mile away from their units uh, and will be going in and out with multiple trips daily and may even have two cars. But their plan is for people to age in place. And a project that DHCD funds in these days has to have units and a parking configuration that allows for not just handicapped spots, but for close spots and a drop-off area, which is why you have those parking places in front. There are going to be people who are frail or uh, less mobile that they're going to need to park as close to the elevator as they can to get to their units. Sure. There are other people that are going to be perfectly happy out in the uh, uh, ends of the site because they're going to get the set their steps in. That's, that's my big thing. And so what we have tried to do is put distinct uh, planting and recreation areas, and we have, as you can see, three on this. We've got kind of an evergreen buffer with a little circular trail in it. We've got this pergola and patio area that is close to the build, very close to the building without a parking lot in between it. And then we've concentrated the parking lots at the end, again, with buffer uh, spaces. Uh, pollinator garden, one of the things we found is that, uh, that we haven't been able to accommodate with our ALF is that there are still a lot of people who are old and perhaps less mobile, but they really would like to have some poppy plants or grow some carrots or whatever. So we've got this pollinator garden, which we could uh, incorporate some space for residents who wanted the garden. But it's all driven by keeping the building massed in front of that pergola, pergola patio area and keeping a relatively short trail area, which you see in the upper left of the, uh, of the building. That's the theory. Okay. Anybody else? Site design? So the, I guess a concern I have is that uh, what you've given us doesn't really take the topography into account. It shows uh, a flat building. Um, it, it seems to show Worcester Street flat. Um, so I, I guess I, I want to hear more about how you're going to kind of accommodate that, the topography there with, the, with this design. We will need to do a survey and we obviously may need to restructure this. The way to restructure it is to raise one end of the building and leave the other where it is, or to lower one end of the building into the ground a little more and leave the other. Uh, the architects... Which side would you put the retaining wall on? <sighs> <laughs> that is a question for our engineer. And again, we have not had 
uh, the time to do a full uh, site survey, but the architects believe that a very low retaining wall would be necessary. It mm -hmm. would do skew the building at all uh, in terms of elevation. It's not going to be a huge blank concrete exposure facing out to the street. I mean, you're going to have some work. Those parking lots, are you going to want them to be flat? They don't have to be flat. They can be a 5% slope. Uh, or well, even I know they can be, but do you want them to be? You want them to be as flat as possible. Yeah. I mean, those are some of the considerations, of course, for the, the community that we're trying to sponsor here. Right. Okay. And, and typically, by the way, if you have two lots, uh, you would try to put the spaces for the more active residents in the one that had a little slope to it, and you'd try the less uh, 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 mobile uh, individuals, you would try to put the lot that they used as absolutely as flat as possible. And you can, you know, again, I, I think the place, I, I, I'm not going to go any further. I, I, I want Mike to weigh in on this if we proceed further and to come up with ideas for exactly the answers to those questions, but we have a very uh, capable team. We're aware of uh, those issues, and we will, we will have something to present. If you were to wet your finger to gauge the weather on this, we're not talking a 15-foot retaining wall on one particular end. Okay. Uh, the, 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 uh, I used to be six feet. I'm 5'10 now. Uh, <laughs> and the architect says I'd be able to climb it, so that's... Okay. So there's a lot of buffering and screening in here to mask and, um, you know, at your lower end, especially where your garden is and your woodland path. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of ways to indoctrinate the, the grading issues that you're going right. to have here down at the base. Right. That's probably the approach... That's normally the approach I would take. I'd rather fill than dig. It's going to be cheaper there, I think. It depends, but well, it, it, it can't. It, sure. Phil, Phil has gone crazy the last year and a half, but okay, fair enough. But we, uh, uh, you know, again, this is something that we did not have time. Mike didn't have it have the free time in his work schedule during the proposal period, but he's worked with us on lots of other projects. I would say, from my perspective, and uh, somebody can stop me if I'm wrong, is your ability to work, especially if the cost drivers are somewhat the same, your screening and buffering from other um, neighbors on Kessel Street um, is far more conducive to hiding and, you know, working with the grades that are there. So if you were to go down there and build up from there, you have residences that are pretty close to your property line up here and some active members that are directly behind your Can't building. Can't see what you're pointing to. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Right here. <laughs> These people are pretty close on this property line. Yeah. Back here. You get and this person is also and, here and, again, and here. And, and that's that why, again, yeah. at the rear of the property, we have older people congregating for barbecues. We have uh, hiking trails. We have tree planting that buffers it, we don't have any cars. And that, I think, was a very conscious part of the design process. Parking in front is conducive to most of our dense apartment building complexes in town. So it's also 122 is all parking in front. It was by design, which is good and bad, but I think it's conducive with Worcester Street. Every single thing we do in a development, and, I, and by we, I mean the entire uh, community, and especially the affordable housing community, is a compromise. And we are always balancing one versus another. I'd love to do platinum energy level compliance. It, it, nobody funds it, and it's very difficult to build that cost into it. I'd love to have fewer parking places, but town isn't going to want it and neither is the HCP you know I mean well we, we stuck with the 1.5 spaces because it's conducive with other zoning in town and seeing that you have to deal with the, the zoning board in town it's nice to stay in harmony with what's existing because it's hard for sure. them to say we want more when you have other complexes that do just fine for the past 30 years on their own right. so some of this is drawn off experience that the trust has in dealing with the 
peculiarities of municipal government, which you guys deal with all the time. I understand. But. I, we've both been involved in municipal government at the local level in towns very similar to this. So. Yeah. We got it. It's, it's homegrown, that's for sure. <laughs> Um, okay, so I had one circle on respects adjacent properties, but I think we kind of covered that as we're going through this. Um, good segue oh, into. I, I just want to say, I, so the things that you've said, uh, I like. Um, I, I'm just not sure what it means that that's not in the proposal. Um, the like the potential for uh, for having different like portions of the building be different heights. Um, I, I'm not sure, I guess, with our process and how this all works, I'm not sure how that factors in. We will have to go through a process to get approvals. And again, this was purely a matter of time. There was not time enough to have a, a, our usual site engineer uh, go through the topo surveys that were available and uh, feed back to the architect, here's your uh, top of foundation for uh, the building, Here's where we're going to need retaining. Here's where we're going to need cut and borrow and fill as we go along. You can't do that in this kind of a time frame. And rather than present uh, imaginary stuff, uh, which I'm sure you've all had proposers do that, we didn't want to produce produce a uh, an imaginary grading plan that would show something that we then couldn't build. We're, we've given you what we got, and we're promising to work with the regulatory authorities and the trust, uh, and we'll have public hearings and meetings as well where the neighbors can come complain if they have complaints. They will. Uh, but rather than showing an imaginary grading plan, I thought it was much better to wait till the next step and uh, get our engineer in there and uh, have him uh, figure out the best way to uh, grade the site and grade the buildings. That's fair. Okay. I'm good. Right. Thank you. Mind you, that overall concept, what you're providing us, is what you want to do. You want a level grade for the building, the entrances, and your primary parking. As, as much as possible. Because it's most cost effective. It's most cost effective. It's also the easiest for the residents. Uh, I'll tell you how we've solved uh, a similar grading problem uh, at our ALF and Gardner, which is a $25 million project. Uh, we had a building that was on two levels. And we needed to have an entrance uh, at that, that was essentially in the basement uh, for people to walk in and to roll their wheelchairs in. Uh, so we took that particular lemon that life gave us and we turned that into the most distinctive design feature of the whole building. We have an elevator shaft that's central to that. The elevators open on both sides, okay? Mm -hmm. So, which is not hugely more expensive than a single door elevator. So the elevator shaft, you come in in this lobby level. We built the lobby level to be open. So there are balconies that overlook it on two sides and so you go up to that first level, get out the other side of the elevator, and you can walk or roll around. And where do you roll around? To the office and library and social areas that look out over the lobby. And uh, what we call the pub, which has coffee during the days and does allow an adult beverage uh, during uh, uh, senior cocktail hour, which is typically five to six, <laughs> and so we have, and again, if you've ever worked with senior housing, uh, you know that people like to know what's going on. <laughs> and those two areas are filled all of the time, and they're watching people come in and go out, they're seeing who's sitting with who, you know, it, it's a social activity center for the building. And that, and that uh, grade level was more than 10 feet. So a two opening elevator, and changing the floor level was one of the things we did. Something similar could be done. I, I've seen, it, it, we're addressing this because it's, it, we, we don't have a topo in front of us, but you know, just to alleviate some of your concerns, I've seen proposals that have far worse grading issues produce very adequate you know, um, 
sight lines from the, the road. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot that they have to work with here that we kind of knew as we we're going through the process. The sight lines on Worcester Street are excellent. Um, so your, your egresses are going to be just fine. There's plenty of room to work in the, in the areas on either wings here for you. Um, you know, it can get expensive, of course, as you know. But there's plenty of room to wiggle in here that make it look exactly like you presented it. Well, I think filling would be dirt cheap in <laughs> comparison <laughs> to cutting and in yeah, comparison to yeah, You wait six months and it's going to cost you twice as much to haul it to you. The dirt's yeah. going to be cheap, but the guy dropping it off or woman dropping it off is going to be enormously expensive. Yeah. Okay. Um, building design. Our resident architect's going to take us through this. <laughs> Just a couple thoughts. And I know cost is a factor and time is a factor, but it's just one straight long building when the context is not that across the street or down the street. And that I'm just speaking from people in the community are going to come and say that. So um, that's one point. I mean, there's multiple things we could do. If we do keep this footprint, we could mess with the roofs a little bit. We can push and pull a little bit more. I think you will have to do one part of the building up and one part of the building down, probably one floor, honestly. Um, there just needs to be some more dimension to it. And I know you have the bays coming out, but I honestly think it has to be more of like a house coming out. Um, just trying to be able to help you defend it to the community. If we are very cognizant of that. We are also very cognizant of the cost factor and how much it's going up. Yeah. And I know so every corner costs an extra dollar. I get it. <laughs> this was the best compromise that our architects felt uh, would work for a preliminary schematic design. Uh, we also talked about offsetting the buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because you can still have the same core. But still keeping the same core. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about bumping out those projections further uh, I don't think yeah. we quite talked about making it a house coming out of a not uh, just not bays but so it might save you money I have to <laughs> but we, we, uh, we have looked at all of those uh, the proportions of it just yeah. need to be a little bit tweaked I think well just again the uh, and I I hope you will look at DHK's portfolio which is online on their website they've done some gorgeous stuff and very talented individuals and it, uh, like I said it was a really a lot of fun working with them mm -hmm. uh, coming up with this but yeah it's subject to uh, within budget uh, yeah. doing something to relieve the mass uh, and what's the materiality gonna was that talked about at all uh, typically we use hardy board over uh, and we try to break up uh, with panels and with mm -hmm. painted uh, different uh, paint color choices if you look on our website WCHR at our past development of the condominium project at 91 Chatham Street uh, it was different architects but this is our development philosophy and if you find that online uh, you can really see how we fit uh, it, it's postmodern Mm -hmm. architecture but it fit into a Victorian neighborhood and there are towers yeah. it doesn't need to be the same right just needs to complement it and that's what we did and if um, you look at that I think you get an idea of how we work with neighborhood residents mm -hmm. to try to make the project as compatible as the budget will allow do you do charrettes or uh, we we did charrettes on that one <laughs> okay and I, I and honestly yeah. this this yeah, team would probably perform very well at a show. And even if this is one with a color, that then that's a different I, I can't, I I can't say that. Like no. I would love to do it. It's really that. easy. Cognizant of right. the of the price drivers that are moving this particular project. Right. So um, I, I think Brittany alluded to it is, you know, th there is a reasonable fight that's going to be had sure. on this particular project. So um, from my perspective, um, you know, you keep the cost down, you can get, you know, people in there and manage the property well, make sure it's upkeeped well, and have it all actually work, and we actually get a building that has some 30% AMI units, yeah. which is a huge win for us, but 
also that you know leads to another point is you know building materials and stuff that you use now the look of it in 20 years can can sour pretty good if you go on the cheap end of it now and again what we've done is hardy board and hardy panel for the uh, the corner boards yep. and that's the building I don't have a problem with that I mean it's what DHCD wants to see yeah. it's long lasting <coughs> and it holds paint like I it does never you probably have a 10 year warranty on that hardy yeah, board for any painting do. and fading yeah, anyway more, so. I think it might even be more than 10 but again if you will go take a look at 91 Chatham Street in our portfolio uh, it's on our online website and that's all hardy board and the project uh, we did that in 2006 and if you want to drive by 91 Chatham Street you will see that it still looks almost like it did the condo owners have not repainted it's the original paint and the original hardy board okay. you can go to Google Street or you can drive by it yourselves and I think you'll say boy that's last pretty long well we put none of those restrictions on anybody else's homes in town that they decide to put up <laughs> Um, we don't even go back if they decide they don't want to live in it for 30 years and tell them they got to cut the grass. So, you know, at the end of the day, what the town decides it wants to do for this particular project is because and, you're... And honestly, at the end of the day, the DHCD architects push us in the direction of compromises yeah. on cost, but their ultimate concern is they don't want to have people driving by a DHCD-funded project in 20 years and saying, boy, this is a slum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I get that. want the people living there to be proud of it, right? Because yeah. then it's yeah. upkept well. It's that broken glass theory. It's just, okay. so. Yeah, and the other thing is that this is just located in a historic district, and, you yeah. know, it's one of the most uh, kind of it's visible. cherished places in Grafton, so we just obviously want to make sure that it's compatible and it's going to be... Uh, yeah, something we're all proud of. <laughs> it's easier for everybody that way. We also have, of course, the, the deed restriction on it. And um, the town did not want us to remediate that particular restriction on it. So the 30 people who came to that meeting didn't want us to. Yeah, but <laughs> to put in anything in reality, the 30 people in that meeting are the people that we need to convince on the project. We don't need to convince anybody else because they're not going to come out and help us. Do you have any handicap units? Uh, I didn't see any on there. Uh, in this, yeah, there are 10% uh, handicap. Okay. And we may not have flushed them out. But They'll probably just put them on the corners yeah. or something. But again, the architects that we're working with are very familiar with the HCD design requirements. The HCD is going to require 10%. We have also sized, this is an interesting point that I don't think I, either I or the architects addressed adequately in the narrative but these units are big and they're big by design uh, the reason that they're big is that there were uh, again it's the DHCD philosophy for senior housing that we need to design units that will evolve with the residents we expect that with aging in place uh, we have 20 percent of the residents that need a more accessible or fully accessible unit so we uh, so his okay. unit four plans yeah have been six seventy it's pretty big yeah and for for a one bedroom senior unit yeah it's pretty big I've got two bedroom units that are smaller than that seriously mm -hmm. uh, but the idea is that as residents age in place and they need more mobility features they need grab bars they might need to have uh, hardware change for uh, entrance and exit they need uh, potentially fully accessible baths and uh, uh, retrofitting of countertops and appliances in the kitchen areas this design I am totally confident uh, will accommodate all of that they are well aware of it it's the DHCD philosophy and if we want to get funded we got to build the units so that they can evolve with the residents right. do we have any other building design concerns uh, financial feasibility <coughs> Anybody have any concerns on this entire back page? It's kind of. I think you went through it a little bit. Yeah, we're kind of there on it. Anybody have anything? But you manage as well. You're not going to hand it off to. It's just they contract with one. They will. We are currently not 
a LIHTC certified okay. uh, manager for this project. But uh, we are uh, we have expanded our property management staff by two full positions, and we are uh, we have a new director of property management who is starting on uh, May first, and this person is fully certified in everything and has done rent up of new uh, projects in the private sector and in the nonprofit sector. Uh, we have a certified property manager who's been out on. Uh, leave for a couple of months now. Uh, I am the asset manager for the agency, uh, but with the, the bringing on of a full, uh, fully certified property director of property management, uh, I will continue to manage the assets and probably some of the construction and maintenance. But we we intend to get certified to manage a light tech project by the time uh, this is ready for rent up. If we will work with, we have several partner agencies that we've worked with uh, for compliance review and initial rent up review. Uh, we are fully aware of the death penalty that THCD, that, uh, that uh, the IRS can impose on a unit if you initially rent up a unit wrong, you lose the whole, you know, lose all the cost of that unit from your basis. Uh, so. We believe we will be ready to manage this by the time it reaches occupancy, and if not, the other entities and agencies that we work with, uh, we would RFP out a management proposal. Uh, that's why we didn't have all of the detail in that way, just a general outline of what we do. But we would we would bring in uh, people to either work with us, or we will be fully cer certified by the time this is ready for uh, occupancy. Can you walk us through briefly your your timeline? What's your your horizon for what I know what you put in here, but what you feel comfortable with, and how you know how much alacrity you can move with? How much alacrity does the town have in its 40B process? Is the question I would ask. Okay, it so, makes a huge difference, and it makes a huge difference for us in our particular situation with safe harbor status. So, um, should I save this discussion for after we make our vote? Yep. All right. Well, then let me just address the. Uh, the no, no, we get no. Let me let me get to the vote because I I go on and on and on <laughs> and I'm gonna I'm gonna move into situate you know subject matter that we all are not gonna be comfortable with. So, um, is everybody ready for a vote? All right. Then I will entertain a motion to um, award the bid to Worcester Community Housing Resources Incorporated. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion on this particular matter? Um, hearing none. All I would just hope that they take into consideration some of the things we've said. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I'll just say I think the the concerns that I've raised. I at this point I feel like they're all addressable, and I I guess I just feel confident that you'll be forced to address them throughout the uh, future <laughs> phase of the project. So. Fair I'm glad enough, you put Dan. that in the motion in the discussion piece. No, no, I'm discussion. I get it. No, no I get discussion. Yeah, no, I think we're all on the same page. Uh, you know, the, with the timeline that, it, that uh, the respondents had, um, it was difficult to get in the level of detail where we all feel totally comfortable. Um, but what what I'm hearing, at least as an individual, is um, that you will continue to work with the town, with the various you know ZBA, ConCom, and, and other regulatory yeah. bodies um, to craft something that'll be acceptable to the town. Are we ready for vote? I got to do it by roll call. Up and I. <laughs> Brittany. Come back to me. <laughs> Come back to you. Eric. Yes, once an I. Bruce is an I. Uh, Kusher, I. Brittany. I. Uh, he's unanimous. Uh, you've been awarded a successful bid. Now we can start oh. talking about some of the. Uh, I know. <laughs> preparing you. Preparing you. Well, which one? Which one? <laughs> um, can, can I describe our proposed timeline first and how we arrived at it? Sure. Okay. Uh, we do not think that we will have all zoning approvals in time for the. It, it just is not feasible to have uh, all of the local approvals in time for the pre application which will in all likelihood be due in September of 2023. That leaves a, leaves a very short window both for the formal process and for the design and for the responsive design to uh, issues that come up 
during that period. So you don't think DHCD is going to have you ready to go before the end of the year? If we apply in September with an incomplete application and without our zoning approvals and our CONCOM and our uh, other local approvals, we will not be invited to participate in the December round. Okay. It's a very short timetable. I don't think anybody could do that unless they were 10 times our size. Uh, so that's the starting point. That means that your first application is in late 2024. You never, I won't say never because we're about to hopefully break that mold, but you almost never get awarded uh, the full funding package on the first application. That is the, the historic truth for the 49 years I've been doing this. So we will figure that we would have to make changes, make alterations, uh, respond to design criticisms, uh, try to keep the costs under control, all of the stuff that they ask you to do, and come back in 2025. So a 2025 funding round would result in an award probably in the summer of 2025 on a good day, and that means that we'd get to closing and construction start in 2026. That's that's our thinking. If 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 you can bust down some doors at DHCD, so that's or the, that's the everything goes right scenario. <laughs> yeah, it could, I mean, I, and again, it can take another year. It, it has happened. Sure. Uh, and senior housing is not the highest level of priority in the DHCD plan, but senior housing that encompasses a broad income range uh, bumps it up a little bit, and sure. especially senior housing that will serve those very poor households that are below 30% AMI. Okay. So ZBA process in this particular town, and they do not have a lot of experience with density. Um, but their experience thus far with single family, duplex, you know, condo type of things, the really easy stuff is somewhere between eight and nine months. That's from time of submission. Mm -hmm. um, their one project where they did incorporate density went back and forth, it took two years. Um, now there was a lot of back and forth between the principal and them, um, and the project is being built now. Um, and I think they're almost at the point where they're renting out some of the first phase of the building. Um, this is an unsubsidized project? It's a subsidized project. The, um, for this particular property, it was acquired via citizens petition at town meeting. It was a fairly well attended town meeting, which bodes well for the argument um, as we're moving it through the system. But um, we currently have, I believe, three lip proposals. Um, for relatively high, is it three? Yeah. Okay. Three lit proposals that are three in, that are endorsed. Yeah, endorsed, and there's one more that has yet to be endorsed for relatively high density. We have a 40R project that's on the other side of town that um, is a, a few hundred units. Um, it stalled out. It put us in safe harbor, um, and that safe harbor has elapsed, even though it's being challenged now. DHD says it's elapsed. So we're gonna assume we're out of safe harbor. There is a particular project that's before the ZBA now, which would cross that 1% threshold and put us back into safe harbor. From our perspective, we would like to be in queue um, before a couple more of these lip proposals get in play, because at a certain point, the ZBA is gonna say, we have three, we can provide a stay, and they will, judging from how they've interacted with the particular project that's before them now. So if they see two more projects over the next six or seven months, they probably will not take on any more, which means we're just gonna ride it out. I don't think there's enough density in there, and I don't think there's enough projects that are gonna come to fruition that we're gonna meet our 10% for Safe Harbor, but we should govern this project and move with a pace that makes sure that we take advantage of either being out of Safe Harbor or having the fear of Safe Harbor. Um, I think the ZBA is very cognizant of the financial aspects of it. Um, they've made several mentions to it in their last couple meetings that when they deny projects that they've made um, unfeasible, that um, they would tend to get, re you know, when it goes through the process. You know that process very well, I'm sure. Um, so it would behoove us to move through the local process 
as quickly as possible. So you can get to the point where we have a submission ready documents and they can start. At the very least, put it on their agenda to open a public hearing and start talking about it. Um, this is, um, I would say it's not a hostile neighborhood, but it, um, it's taken us two years to get to the point where we've put in the RFP. Um, and there has been some points where it has been, um, you know, this, the normal 30, 35 people that show up. I'm guessing they will also show up with a very different, you know, war paint on, so to speak, when it's before ZBA and has um, a board that's, you know, more conducive to their thought process. Um, so if you can pick up the meetings, um, we have them all on tape, we'll provide them for you and kind of see what the argument is shaking up and how the ZBA's response to it might help you in some of your um, further review of this particular site. It's also nice that you have graves because Jeff is also does all the work for ZBA um, and he can make you aware of some of the um, the cosmetics and the features that are there because the one project that they did do and signed off on um, they didn't ask for more affordability they didn't ask for more units to be affordable lower AMI thresholds things of that nature they asked for cosmetics um, and that's how it's been for most of the projects that have come through town. But these are the hard ones for them. They're just now getting into it. And I won't say they're woefully unprepared for it, um, but my general first impression of it is, you know, if they don't see a lot of these things, there's gonna be a learning curve for them. Mm -hmm. um, they'll scale, they're fine. They've got plenty of help there. Um, but watch the meeting, and it will give you a, you know, a wonderful insight into what we're gonna have to deal with on the and they're available on the town website or yeah so YouTube YouTube yeah okay all of them YouTube graphs and zoning and Board of Appeals yeah we'll send them over to you well I know what I'm going to be doing after I get home <laughs> some of them are if you want to watch yourself on TV but you'll be there <laughs> I, I would say it's not I'm, no <laughs> this project <laughs> I feel the same way about myself this project is a town project it would hard, be hard for them to deny the, the fact that this went to town meeting and our legislative body said this is what we want to do here. They may have qualms about the overall density and things like that, but we need to provide something that actually helped people. The, this particular project is going to do exactly that. Um, and there are members there that have stated that this is what they're looking for, this is what they get. We are responsive we are looking to increase our municipal uh, partnerships. We're doing 20-ish. We don't have a final number yet. Uh, first time home buyer town home project in Fitchburg where the town is selling us the land for $10,000. The town is remediating a part of the brownfields issue on it before we take ownership of it. We're going to take the EULA to another level so that we will have a pretty much clean site and we've been working closely with the Fitchburg Community Development Office on that project. Uh, we're trying to expand our ability to do things like this with other towns in the area or county-wide organizations and uh, examples of municipal partnerships like this kind of project uh, are something we really want to add to our track record and to our portfolio. So uh, this is that's why we responded, and we have a good architect, a good financial consultant, and a good engineer. The most, I, this is my perspective, and I only, I got a few years dealing with, with this stuff. Um, a, a selling point, and I hate to call it that, but a good selling point is the, the argument can be made that this facility helps people that are trying to age in place in the community that where they grew up and lived their whole lives to actually be able to afford to live here for the remainder of their lives. Right. That's the argument. And it would be very difficult to say, speak against that. Which in turn opens up more housing for families. And yeah, but nobody cares about the tertiary and that's why your benefits are any of this. <laughs> they, they really it's, don't. It's that's, so I, I, chair, get it, I get it. Um, I just want to make a note, we are approaching 10 o'clock. Oh, so you want to leave? 
I do. Uh, I'm just making a note of it. I do too. I okay. do. Do with that information what you will. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a two-hour so, ride home, so I'm not oh going to object to Yeah, we got a lot of that. Okay, well, now you made me feel bad for going on and on. So I will save this for the next meeting. We'll coordinate with um, through Amber, which is convenient for everybody, because um, a single point of contact, um, the next steps in this, this phase. Um, we'll want to do that relatively quickly. So we meet as a trust every second Thursday of the month. Um, but now that this has been committed, um, if it's a review process for a PNS and stuff like that, you know, we, we still have the, you know, a very public process through the next ordeal anyways. Our council um, is uh, Cedar and Chandler, and Todd Rodman is our lead attorney, and he has worked on proposals uh, with every, I think every town or county at one point. Yeah, so it would be best for us to start that right away. So we'll put you in touch with, with Seth, Kathleen O'Donnell, who will do it. Um, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Oh, so you moved. did have, you had one more agenda item to review the housing production plan but if nobody has any comments on that you can e just okay so that. everybody has a copy of it we're yeah. meeting in full zoom next week to go over it with karen in place so anything that you have please send to amber and um, not everybody mm -hmm. in the group and then we'll add it to a, a going list fiona also has some comments and stuff too and so we'll make it a working document we can get there we can review everything this of course would be a big addition to it as well so she needs to be aware of this process second did we already second <laughs> motion's been made and seconded. did you i did uh, i moved it well. uh <laughs> all those in favor we're gonna do it by roll cross we're gonna get out of here aye 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 aye, aye. i'm supposed aye. to say your name but whatever we're out